Day one of the 2013 NFL Draft is officially in the books, and what a wild and wacky day number one it was, as you had to know it was going to be going into tonight. You had just had to know that it was going to be very unpredictable. With the lack of elite talent at the top, you knew all types of crazy things could happen. And boy, we got those crazy things, that's for damn sure. Uh, I will say this, is that if you take nothing else away from the first day of the draft, it should be this, is that teams pick where they pick for a reason. There are certain teams that get the draft process. They understand how the game is played. They understand how to evaluate talent. They understand how to prioritize things. They don't panic and let a player drop to them of great value at a position of need. Or when they figure out that they do need a player at a certain position, they decide maybe they make a move to go get them but they don't trade away the farm necessarily to do so. And that's why those teams are picking later in the draft and why those teams are making playoff appearances. Then you have those other teams that continue to make the same dumb-ass mistakes over and over and over and over again. And then they wonder why the next year they're in the same draft position. The year after that they're in the same draft position. The guys they took two years ago end up being bust, so they end up trying to replace them with other busts. It's a vicious, never-ending cycle. And you see that out of some teams. One that's very close to my heart. I do have to say in general that it was a lot of fun to watch the first round of the draft. It's a great weekend experience, no question about it. I watched it with a Packer fan, a Viking fan, and a Raider fan tonight. And it's interesting to see these other guys and their emotions and their reactions when their teams are on the clock and when their teams make their picks. Uh, so it's a lot of fun, even if you end up disappointed and brokenhearted like me. Again, no surprise there whatsoever. So let's talk about some of the big winners and losers from day one in this 2013 NFL draft. Let's go positive here, and let's talk about some of the big winners first. There were definitely some big winners on day one of the draft. E.J. Manuel, he was the only quarterback taken in round one. He went 16th overall. Obviously, a big win for him. <laughs> Obviously. Uh, but you look at other teams, the teams that sat there, didn't move up, didn't move down. They just sat there and said, hey, we identify a couple of players. One of these guys drops to us. He's at a position of need. He's best player available. We're going to take him. And it's funny how those teams usually end up doing very well year in and year out. Uh, you look at teams like the Baltimore Ravens taking Matt Elam, who was a, one of the best players available at a position of need. The Houston Texans, I think, helped themselves out tremendously, tremendously, by being able to take DeAndre Hopkins, number 27. For years, they've needed to address that number two wide receiver position uh, opposite Andre Johnson, and they've taken a very good one. I may have taken Cordero Patterson if I was in their position, but he was one of the best players available, Hopkins was, as a huge position of need, by far the number one need for the Houston Texans, and significantly upgrades that passing attack that they have down there in Houston. Uh, you look at other teams, such as the Cincinnati Bengals, and you sit there and say tight end wasn't a huge need, but Tyler Eifert's there at 21. You've got to take him. In today's NFL, you can't have too many weapons in the passing game. The Bengals organization, after years of being horrible and not understanding how the draft is uh, done, have started to get it. And that's why, to me, the Bengals are a dark horse pick to be Super Bowl contenders in the AFC in 2013 because of draft selections like Tyler Eifert, number 21. Now you've given your young quarterback, Andy Dalton, yet another weapon to work with in the passing game. The Pittsburgh Steelers had Jarvis Jones fall to him. Isn't it funny how almost every year... The Steelers seem to get a guy that just, you know, drops to him, so it's great value, and the pick ends up making a tremendous amount of sense. Did it again with Jarvis Jones. You look at the Carolina Panthers. This is a team that historically tends to get the first-round picks right more often than not. And here, Star Latulule falls to them at 14. You could argue best player available, huge position of need, the defensive tackle in the middle of Ron Rivera's defense. But you had two other teams that did a combination of things. You had the St. Louis Rams, to me, the second really big winners of the night. They're really starting to reap the benefits of the trade they made out of the number two overall pick last year. This is where they start to see the benefits. It puts them in a position of power this year, and it will again next year as well. And they utilize that power very, very well. 
by going up from 16 to 8 to go get that playmaker that can help out Sam Bradford in the passing game of Tavon Austin. And then taking that 22nd pick, getting some more ammo for later on, moving down to 30 and still getting and still getting Alec Ogletree, their guy, a playmaking linebacker that you can line up next to Laronitis. That Rams defense is going to start looking scary. Maybe they didn't get that safety, but they still have some safeties on the board for day two. But to be able to get a guy like Austin and a guy like Ogletree, by understanding that you needed to identify your guy in Austin and go up and get him because he wasn't going to be there, but understanding you could peel back a little bit on the flip side with Ogletree because he would be there. Genius by Les Snead, the general manager, and Jeff Fisher, the head coach there in St. Louis. They're building something really nice there. Minnesota, to me, was the big winner. Sharif Floyd falls to them at 23. Maybe the best player available on the board at that point. Xavier Rhodes, you could argue, best player available at the board at 25. And both of those players filled huge positions of need for that Vikings defense. No question about it. They needed a tackle opposite Kevin Williams. They needed a big physical uh, number one corner. That's what they feel they got in Xavier Rhodes. And then to sit there and say, you know, we need a wide receiver. And we identified our guy. It's Cordero Patterson. We're not going to miss out on him. We had to take these two guys because they were too good of values at positions of need. But we still want this guy to understand that it's okay to take a second, third, fourth, and seventh round pick. Be aggressive and fucking go for it because you did a good job in the draft last year, both at the top and throughout. It allows you some flexibility to take a gamble and say, we want Cordero Patterson because we want another playmaker for Christian Ponder in that offense to take some of that pressure off of Adrian Peterson. The Vikings did just that, and that's why, to me, out of all the teams that did well on the first day, of which I've named them, uh, the Minnesota Vikings, to me, were the biggest winners of all with a definite, very big honorable mention to the St. Louis Rams. Start off with Geno Smith and some of the other quarterbacks like Barkley and Nassib. They didn't get drafted in day number one, so they're going to have to wait until Friday to hear their name called. So not a good day for them. You know, they have to be losers, and that's just the way it is for them, sadly. Uh, in terms of teams that I thought really didn't do themselves any favors, uh, the Dallas Cowboys, what the fuck were they doing? It's one thing to trade down from 18 to 31, but they got caught up in the wave. They panicked. Because they said, oh, we've had you know seven offensive linemen already going round number one. We're afraid that this guy here, who really carries honestly a third round grade, might not be there towards the end of round two. So we got to take him now in Travis Frederick. A good player, but not the 31st overall pick. Just again, epitomizing and crystallizing to me why Dallas needs a general manager. The only way the Dallas Cowboys are ever going to become real legitimate contenders is for Jerry Jones to realize that he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. Speaking of organizations and teams that don't know what the fuck they're doing, the Cleveland Browns, you hire an offensive coach, you bring in a whole new front office to take a pass rusher sixth overall and not even the best pass rusher of the lot, Barcavius Mingo? That's why the Cleveland Browns are irrelevant. That's why the Cleveland Browns suck. And that's why the Cleveland Browns continue to miss the playoffs and continue to be picking in the top 10 most damn years because of dumbass picks like this, period. End of discussion. Another team that surprised me. It wasn't necessarily the worst thing, but Miami trading up from 12 to 3 to take Deion Jordan was a huge surprise. That's literally something that nobody was talking about happening. Nobody saw it coming. This blindsided everybody, and I think it, quite frankly, blindsided a lot of NFL executives to the point where once that happened, it just threw the whole rest of the draft into chaos. You know, I look at Deion Jordan, and when you're talking about him being an elite pass rusher, and they're showing the highlights of him on ESPN, and they're showing him a pass coverage, that doesn't mean he's an elite pass rusher. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering what he's going to play in Miami. Is he going to be an end? Is he going to be an outside linebacker? Man, you know, if, granted they only had to give up an, an additional second-round pick to move up nine spots, but giving up a first and a second to go up nine spots to get a guy like Deion Jordan? Whew. No. No. Jeff Ireland's made some other questionable moves in this offseason, and I think this was just another one of them. <sighs> 
the New York Jets. They need to rebuild. They just traded away Darrell Revis for the 13th overall pick and a couple of other mid-round selections. So, of course, they decide to make lateral dumb dick moves by taking D. Milner ninth overall, a corner, and then coming back at 13 and taking Sheldon Richardson. Now, this is an example here of where I felt both players were really good value at those spots. But both players were horrible picks for the Jets, not because of the players, but because of the Jets and what they needed. You want to talk about all you can about Sanchez and how bad he sucks, and you can say it, and it's fine. But they have done diddly dick to help him out and surround him with talent. And the reason why they have it surrounded with more talent is because they continue to draft freaking defensive players in round number one. So it's almost like you basically traded away Darrell Revis for D. Milner, even though they technically used the pick on Sheldon Richardson. How many fucking first-round picks do you need to spend on defensive linemen? That's three straight damn years with Wilkerson, Copels, and now Richardson. You spend first-round picks on defensive linemen. At least if you're going to spend a first-round pick on a front seven player, it could have been an outside linebacker, which you really needed. But this should have been two offensive players, either a guard and a fucking tight end, or they should have traded up a little bit to try and get Austin, or they should have taken a quarterback and Eifert, any number of combinations of things other than what the fuck the Jets did. And again, this is why the Jets suck. This is why the Jets will be picking in a mediocre position next year. This is why this organization doesn't effing matter, and they're a joke and a laughing stock. But when it comes to laughing stocks in the NFL draft, by far, by far to me, the Chicago Bears under Phil Emery, second time around, are establishing themselves as complete morons. You know, it was bad enough that we had two guards go in the top 10, four offensive tackles in the top 11. Then Justin Pugh goes 19th to the Giants. I kind of like Pugh, so I'm not pooning that pick that much. The Bears decided, ah, Geno Smith's on the board. Tyler Eifert's on the board. Cordero Patterson is on the board. Just, I'm looking offensive side only. Not to mention the other defensive players that were on the board. So you mean to tell me, Phil Emery, Chicago Bears organization at Hallis Hall, that out of all the players on your board, you had Kyle Long, a guy who started four fucking games at Oregon. Four! As your top available player on the board. Are you stupid or just plain dumb? It's bad enough that you made a boneheaded pick in the first round last year with Shea McClellan. He wasn't even the best available player left in his damn position. That was Chandler Jones. This time around, you're trying to address the offense. Oh, don't give me that shit about you need to address the offensive line. Not when there are much better players available. No. Eifert, much better. Cordero Patterson, much better. DeAndre Hopkins, much better. Geno Smith, much fucking better. I knew Kyle Long had a chance to go maybe in the top portion of the second round. And maybe somebody would get really stupid and take him at the bottom of round one. But I did not expect that the Bears would stand pat at number 20 with all these other much better players on the board and take Kyle Long. So either Phil Emery and his scouting department are complete nincompoops who don't understand how to rate players on the big board. They go, thur, 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 or they don't understand how the draft game is played. Maybe you do like a player, but maybe you don't have to take them where the hell you're trying to take them. You could try to trade back a little bit, get some extra picks. Otherwise, maybe reassess what the hell your thought process is. Kyle Long, a guy who started, what, four games at freaking Oregon. You don't even know if he's a tackle or a damn guard. He may be too tall to play guard, and he might not have good enough technique to play tackle. So the second straight year in the first round, picking in a similar spot, last year at 19 with McClellan, this year 20 with Kyle Long, I go on and on about how stupid this fucking organization is. You take yet another project without a clearly defined position at the NFL level. It's only going to get worse for the Chicago Bears. What a raging start to the Mark Trestman era. Fucking fire Phil Emery now. You want to know what grade I gave for the Bears on this pick? I gave them an L. As in, a long way from being a good pick. As in, a long way from understanding how the draft works. A long way from Emery being a competent GM. A long way from being Super Bowl contenders.